Renaissance people. We are back at it today to talk about the single most achieved painter to come out of the Venetian Renaissance, none other than the famed Titian. The decision of this topic came as a result of our Instagram poll. If you want to participate in future polling or anything else of the nature, follow the show at Italian underscore Renaissance underscore podcast on Instagram. I want to thank everyone who voted and participated just when I thought you were sick of hearing me talk about painting too, when you guys voted on Titian. That is not to say that the other topics won't be covered. I fully intend to address those soon. One was the relationship between Tullio Lombardo and Michelangelo, a subject of some of my recent research that's very fun and speculative approach to analysis of Michelangelo's early works in light of Tullio Lombardo. The other choice was Gaspara Stampa, one of the most important female poets of the Renaissance. Both of these are coming and more. But the people have spoken, and so I present to you, to the best of my ability, with sincere reverence, the career of Titian in three works, one religious, one courtly, and one mythological. Impossible, you say? I do agree. You can't possibly demonstrate the entire career of this very busy painter in only three works, but my aim is to give a cursory overview of the types of works he did in a more specific, uh, and in more specifically how his style changed over his lifetime. We're going to look at more than three guys, okay? Titian lived a long life, but was a bit of a fibber about his age. We can roughly estimate that he was born in the late 1480s and certainly died in the year 1576. That's meaning he lived roughly into his 90s. Could have died late 80s, could have made it as far as 100. We don't know for sure. But that is a long career. And for him, a very successful one during his lifetime, as opposed to some artists that become famous after their lifetime. Tiziano Vicellio is his name, was born in the small town of Pieve di Cadore, which was part of the Venetian Republic and transferred to Venice itself at a very young age. He begins his training in the Bellini workshop of Gentile and Giovanni, which should sound familiar to you guys. Next slide, please. What's going on here? However, Titian seemed to be inclined toward new versions of presenting tradition in art, the tradition inherited by Jacopo Bellini that became a standard of late Quattrocento Venetian painting. He is drawn to work, uh, pardon, he's drawn to work with none other than Giorgione da Castelfranco. This history I covered a few episodes back by looking at their collaboration on the Dresden Venus and ultimately one of Titian's masterworks, the Venus of Urbino. So even though I said we're going to look at three works, we've already looked at, at some, of, some of the works, right? Giorgione dies of the plague in 1510, still a young man, and as such, Titian is left as the most innovative and dynam dynamic painter in Venice. When Giovanni Bellini dies in 1516, there is no painter in the city left that will rival Titian. It is in the period following their deaths that he completes one of his most celebrated masterpieces of his early career in the first work of our discussion today, The Assumption of the Virgin for the Gothic Church of Santa Maria Gloriosa dei Frari, also known simply as the Frari, the work itself was commissioned by the abbot of the church monastery, Fra Germano. The work is an altarpiece. It's enormous scale, about 22 and a half feet by 11 feet. An altarpiece is a work designed for an altar in a church, if you couldn't guess. The work still remains in the high altar of the Frari today, designed to complement the tall, high-reaching Gothic interior of the church. Let's have a look at it. The altarpiece shows a scene of the Assumption, a belief that the body of the Virgin Mary was assumed into heaven, thus leaving behind no bodily relic, her body joining her soul in heaven. What do we see? A dramatic clash of, on the lowest register of apostles as the Virgin is assumed into heaven. They're sort of reaching towards her, dragging your eye towards her. 
Note how Titian expertly uses red to direct your eye. You go from the lowest register of the apostles in red, that sharp diagonal on the right that goes up his arm and into the clouds where all of these cherubs and putti are coming together and lifting the virgin and her typical blue overcoat is blowing back, showing you a lot more of that red. She's contrasted in the sky, which is said to evoke the kind of golden rounded arches of the mosaics in San Marco. And above her, God the Father too, ready to receive the Virgin Mary into heaven, has this kind of red overcoat diagonally swooping in to receive her. While Titian was working on this, he was given a lot of pushback from Fra Germano, complaining that the scale was not right, the figures were too big, the virgin should be bigger than the apostles, and what have you. But Titian was quite adamant about his design, in which some external, uh, external forces helped persuade the abbot to just wait and see the full effect of the work. Ludovico Dolce, a writer and early theorist in painting uh, and a contemporary of Titian's, he wrote about the reception of this work in quite sharp language, actually. Um, here is what he said. Quote, here Titian, a young man even now, painted in oils the virgin ascending to heaven. And certainly the grandness and awesomeness of Michelangelo, the charm and loveliness of Raphael, and the coloring proper to nature are incorporated into this painting. It was, nevertheless, the first public commission that Titian carried out in oils, and he did it in the shortest space of time and in his youth, all of which meant that the clumsy artists and dimwit masses who had seen up till then, nothing but the dead and cold creations of Giovanni Bellini, Gentile, and Vivari, uh, Vivarino. Uh, da, da, da. Works that had no movement and no projection grossly maligned the same picture. Meaning they were wasted on seeing something that it was now invigorating the tradition with some kind of new movement, right? And he says, and certainly one can speak of a miracle at work in the fact that without as yet having seen the antiquities of Rome, meaning Titian hadn't been to Rome yet, which were a source of enlightenment to all excellent painters and purely by dint of that little tiny spark, which he had uncovered in the works of Giorgione, Titian discerned and apprehended the essence of perfect, <laughs> excuse me, the essence of perfect painting. Let me clarify that for you. Titian has moved away from established standards of Venetian painting established by the Bellini school, which Dolce calls dead and cold. But when the envy cooled off, so to, to quote, of his new style, his defiance of that tradition became not only accepted, but the new direction of Venetian painting as a whole meaning it wasn't received well, but then later, they'll, after he becomes a little more popular, they're like, okay, this is great. <laughs> so what exactly is he innovating? It's all in the brushwork and movement of the fig figures. Tom Nichols, who I always come back to because I love his book on, on Venetian art, says that, quote, Titian uh, presents the Virgin's Ascent as if it were happening in the present moment abandoning the usual image of still and timeless spiritual reflection, which, unquote, which is the Bellini, the still timelessness. It should be able to transcend time and be spiritual in, in all of its aspects, not just the moment that Titian is capturing in his painting here. So in challenging pictorial conventions, so too are religious modes of reading an image being changed, which can always cause some resistance. The colors in the assumption are generally saturated according to tradition. We have in the past talked about challenging the notion of simply contrasting Florentine disegno, line-based, design-based, drawing-based painting, and Venetian colore or colorito. And I have argued that the Quattrocento is uh, in more of an exchange between the two schools rather than Venetian colorito, F Florentine disegno. 
However, with Titian, the full effect of using color and brush stroke is something entirely new. And later Titian is going to be this full force of colorito as we'll see. Look closely at God the Father. Titian is using his brush strokes loosely as a way to imply shape and form rather than the meticulous detail of doing it. Truly, it is not in this work that the technique comes into full effect, but his later works, as I said, which we'll get to. However, we see in this altarpiece the early traces of it as a prelude to painting uh, a painting form that truly anticipates Impressionism centuries later. In his lifetime, Titian was among the first artists to be in high demand in courts across Europe, not just within Italy. As such, Titian is primarily known as the portrait painter, as the portrait painter of Italy, right? Not just um, the, the, I've lost my train of thought, as the portrait painter of the 16th century. This designation places Titian at the center of an international demand for his skill set that is unparalleled by any other painter in Venice. So who are some of the notable figures that Titian painted portraits for now that we're going to transition away from religious work? Remember, I said we're going to do a religious piece, portrait, and we're going to do mythology. So just in Italy, beyond, but before we get to the international scope of things, he's painting Pope Paul III, Doge Andrea Gritti, Pietro Aretino, Isabella d'Este, Tommaso Mosti of the Este family, and Alfonso d'Este, Duke of Ferrara, who is the very Duke who commissions the famous Bacchus and Ariadne that Titian paints, this one, which is, which is now in the National Gallery of London. He did portraits for Ranuncio Farnese and the Vendramin family of Venice too, among other countless others not to mention numerous self-portraits. Uh, self and there's a good reason to believe some of his allegorical or mythological portraits, such as the Flora, the goddess Flora, may indeed be portraits of the famed courtesans, the kind of elite sex workers of Venice in his period. His international works begin with the meeting of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, who he paints several portraits for in 1548 and throughout the relationship, but during his stay in the imperial court in Augsburg. He um, also painted his wife, the Empress Isabella of Portugal. And Titian enjoyed ample commissions from and portraits from Philip II of Spain, as well as his famous Poesie, uh, poesie series of the mythological works based on Ovid, including Diana and Acteon, which is now in London, and The Rape of Europa in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. I actually have a little video of that one that I filmed when I was there on, on the Instagram. His success as a portrait painter comes in his ability to balance and jump between his trademark painterly style between realism and actually improving upon the likenesses of his sitters. Likewise, as a master oil painter, he can express the wealth and prestige of his patrons through multiple textures and materials, considering that portraits are commissioned to tell you something about a sitter, often their material wealth or their valor. Let's look at our second major example of this podcast. I am now turning to Titian's portrait of Philip II, which is in the Prado Museum in Madrid, and it was completed around 1551. What do we have? Full length image of who is at the time Prince Philip II. He becomes, he becomes King Philip II of Spain, and he is in armor and in leggings, and he's holding a sword. We can see his whole body top to bottom. His hand is off on this decorative helm with this feather plume. The background is kind of splotchy and painted dark so that he stands out and contrasts against it. And you have the corner of some architecture, a column, but it's a symbol, right? A column of, of some sort of more ancient heraldry that these people consider themselves to be in the line of, but it's also a base of strength, of fortitude. And in the end, what you have is Philip II, a prince, 
his unique individual features stand out in dignity beyond the rich reds of the of the table table fabric right like this sort of cloth the full length of the work you still have his individual likeness right all of that is done in his developing painterly fashion quick strokes here and there implications of form that are done in just hurried brush strokes and the use of impasto for thick bright reflective highlights impasto is the technique that vincent van gogh pioneers as a total style but that is the intentional laying on of a thick noticeable stroke of paint it is the illusion of detail and yet so textured giving each material a unique essence but also a reflectiveness in varying degrees depending on how thick you lay on the paint the reality is that there is a great deal of variation across Titian's portraits and he is able to adjust his style and technique to accommodate the needs of his sitter the court he is painting for and what exactly his noble patrons hope to achieve in having their image painted by his hand Philip II's portrait was copied and it's in the inventory of his aunt as well so P Titian does several in this in this fashion for Philip II to transition now, having covered his early religious works and his proliferation as a court painter, I want to look at his mythological works, namely my personal favorite, in for whatever that tells you about me, The Flaying of Marsyas. The work was likely completed in the end of the 1570s when Titian was in his 80s or 90s. It is one of several examples of this later style you will note when we look at it a marked departure from the full color saturation the extremely and extremely thick brush strokes right we're going to get much looser brush strokes now if you recall the details we discuss on the assumption where he introduces this loose brush stroke in 1516 by 1570 something whenever this painting was done it becomes and the entire painting we said it was in god the father and some other details now the whole painting is done like that the absolute pinnacle of venetian colorito there are two essential sources to understand this image and for the video folks this image that i'm showing you is one of the sources it's not the painting the first is the clear compositional reference to an earlier drawing the one shown by giulio romano a Roman artist who was the pupil of Raphael. The other is from a text source of its metamorphosis, a common source for Renaissance artists and one that Titian calls upon very often in his mythological works. I want to warn you, the story and painting will induce a bit of discomfort. I am not squeamish myself, but there is an undeniable feeling that swells in your gut when uncovering the story i'm going to read very short 18 lines from ovid that tells the unfortunate fate of marsyas quote so that story was ended that's referring to the story above in this book somebody began another about a satyr whom Lot uh <laughs> whom Latona's son, that's Apollo, surpassed at playing the flute and punished sorely, flaying him. So the skin all left his body. So he was one great wound with the blood flowing, the nerves exposed, veins with no cover of skin over their beating surface lungs and entrails visible as they functioned the country people the woodland gods the fauns his brother satyrs the nymphs and even olympus whom he loved through all his agony all wept for him with every shepherd looking after his flocks along those mountainsides, the fruitful earth, 
drank in those tears and turned them into water and sent them forth to air again, a rill, a stream, the clearest of all the running Phrygian rivers, named Marsyas for the victim. Isn't that terrible? Let's look at some of the details of this painting. Poor Marsyas is in the middle of being flayed. What has he done? He's challenged Apollo to a music contest. That is his punishment. He is flayed, suspended upside down. Hubris, maybe, is why he's earned this fate. A man to the left of him in a Fergian cap flays his leg, helping ground the myth in the location. If you recall what I said in Ovid, all of the rivers of Fergia, whatever it was, this is the, the indicator of where they are, right? Fergia is the place, as Ovid tells us. King Midas, identified by a very particular type of crown, watches in dismay, his hands up to his chin. It has been proposed that actually Midas is a self-portrait of Titian. Another satyr stands off to collect the skin in a bucket or blood or whatever he's collecting. He's just helping out, helping him flay all poor Marsyas, I guess. Golden-haired Apollo is the one kneeling, removing the skin from around his ribs. It's really hard to see. Look closely. It's awful when you get up close and personal with that, okay? There's behind them, looking up to the heavens, a lyre player looking up to the heavens, the pan flute suspended from this tree. It's been identified with Apollo as well. So Apollo could be both figures or it's Orpheus. Okay. All while, get this part, a cute little puppy laps up the blood of poor Messiah's dripping in the foreground. And you know what, guys? This is just terrible, but I love this painting and I don't really quite understand why. It has something to do with the effect of it. Sure, you shouldn't challenge Apollo in music playing. Yet, Titian gives us this dark, gruesome composition that does not appear to actually praise the punishment of hubris, right? You're supposed to say, okay, you don't challenge the gods, you know, stay in your lane or you'll be punished sort of thing. But you're not getting that sense. You're feeling kind of agony for him. Instead, we're compelled to some sort of sympathy for the satyr and guys satyrs are often representative of the bestial and the human combined and they serve as a warning to balance certain animalistic tendencies kind of like centaurs there is no absolute interpretation of this but the idea that it represents the shedding of one's skin particularly the concept of corporeal wild dionysian aspects of the human identity, that's a strong contender for what this painting is supposed to mean. But then why is it so full of melancholy and gut-wrenching violence? You know, in a, it's so, it's hard to look at, to look at poor Marsyas' face as he's in pain. They're just slicing away at his skin and it's just terrible. Well, an outbreak of plague swept through Venice in the year 1576 surrounded by a new wave of very visceral death could be a reason we see such a grim depiction of a myth meant as a moral lesson it's hard to see i know titian's sadness is not going to last though because he dies of that very same plague on august 27th of 1576 leaving behind a studio of works in his late painterly style. His son and pupil, he died that year as well, Orazio Vicelio. Titian was buried at the Frari, the very church where his famous Assumption of the Virgin still is today. Later, the master Italian neoclassicist, Italian, uh, Italian, Antonio Canova, would design an alarmingly marvelous tomb in his honor that actually has his Assumption, which is in the same church, carved in relief marble. Titian's influence does not stop at his death. 
His contemporaries, such as Tintoretto and Veronese, will take after his influence, as well as painters in the likeness of Rembrandt and Peter Paul Rubens in the north, Velazquez in Spain, and as we said, one might even find hints of his, of his influence in the age of Impressionism, centuries later, namely Edouard Manet, who actually directly studies Titian. And he famously did Olympia, which, which um, looks after the Venus of Urbino, not just in painterly style, but in composition. Let's look again, folks. The assumption, the portrait of Philip II of Spain, the flaying of Marsyas, all of these are by the very same artist and really look nothing alike. Tiziano Vicelio, it's demonstrating the rough beginnings of a move away from a Venetian Renaissance style grounded in the Bellini tradition to something that looks closer to the roots of European modernism. He lived a long life often touted as the Michelangelo of Venice and the historical records maintain that, I believe. I hope that I was able to give Titian justice in his treatment of his life and his works. I assure you, we have not seen the last of him by any means. I wanna thank you all for joining me today as usual and for your continued support of this project. As always, follow the Instagram, like us on Facebook, check out the Italian Renaissance shop on Etsy, and consider becoming a patron on Patreon to support the show. All of that and more is in the show notes if you need any links. Until next time, my dear listeners, arrivederci.